want to start out with a question today because as uh, I've gone through the last few months, Judy and I have had a lot of trials, a lot of things that were overwhelming in our life. So I ask you the question, have you ever been overwhelmed? Have you ever been given like too much to handle or buried beneath, just like a huge mess? Or have something that triggers a strong emotional effect on you? Do you ever ponder those things and think, how do I respond? And what is the catalyst that sets me in one direction or another? When things happen at work, when things happen with people we love, or people that maybe we do not like at all, uh, how do we handle those trials? How about your place in this life? Your daily existence in this trying world? Does it ever overwhelm you? Does it ever become too much for you? You know, when we don't look at being overwhelmed in the proper sense, we're going to have negative effects. And they're going to make a direct outcome on us. And they're also going to show us how profitable or unprofitable our life would be. You know, for me, and, and all the moments that we have been going through the, these months, it tends, you tend to have the cardinal effect of just giving up on everything. Just kind of like finding a place where you don't even have to think about anything. For, for, and at least in my case, right? So uh, if I don't think about anything, I don't have to deal with anything. So I just try not to deal with it. Uh, but is that profitable? I mean, I ask you this question because we all have hard moments. We all have hard days, or weeks, or maybe even years. And they try our resolve. And so we have to ask our question, how do we handle those? How do we handle those strong emotions that trigger our response? And how is our response show our character? I mean, when our character is tested, how do we come out? You know, as for me, as before Christianity, I look back at myself, and you know, that's one thing God gives us the great opportunity through his instructions to do, right? So as I ponder my former self, I, th I thought to myself, boy, how could I ever be any help to God? You see, repaying evil for evil was just up my line, right? If you'd done something wrong to me, I was going to wrong you back. You know, uh, growing up in, in, uh, in, as a young man in Chicago, I became a little bit of a roughneck, so to, sp so to speak, right? And I wouldn't let you even look crossly at me, right? I would just use that as an, as an excuse to, let me say, overwhelm you. I mean, think about it. Through all those trials that I was going through, the uh, effects that I had in my early life, right? The effects that I had, I was born three pounds, for example, right? And I was born dead. A nun breathed life into me. And because of that, I was never treated the, way, the same as the rest of the children in the room. Because through those overwhelming moments, my mom handled them poorly. And I became an outcast of my own family. And becoming an outcast did something, right? It gave me a sense of maybe, maybe bitterness, maybe, uh, you know, just uh, anger or resentment. And so as I was growing up, I went through many a, a trials becoming, you know, because I didn't have any direction, if you really think about it. I was an outsider of my own family, plus I had no, I had no godly background beside 
uh, Sunday school. And that was not Sunday school, it was actually just going to church on Sunday in a Catholic church, which really didn't give us much direction on how to live our life, right? But as I, so as I grew, I became more embittered. I became more reckless. And you know, I could say I was a cat. I talked this off often with my wife. I probably should have been dead nine, nine times. There was, there was just like nine different times where I wonder how the heck I came out the other side. And I can actually say that on one occasion when I almost got ran over by this train, I was, I was heading off, I had to catch the train to go uh, to the suburbs of Chicago, and I came up and I was on the wrong side of the tracks. Well, there was about three foot of snow out there, and I thought, well, hey, I'll just run over, jump that, I'm a young man, right? Jump that barbed wire fence, run over to the other side, because the train's stopping over there, and I'll get on the, walk over and get on the train. Well, as I ran, I jumped and I fell. And guess what? The, the train didn't stop over there. The train stopped way past where I was at. The middle of the train stopped there but the front of the chain was way past where I was at. As I jumped over, I fell. Here I am in three foot of snow, and I have no, I looked over and the train was upon me. I had nothing to do but roll. Now what's the chance of you rolling perfectly straight for five feet? As the train went by the side of my head, not touching any part of my body, I said, oh, thank you, God. That was my response, being not even a Christian whatsoever, Thank you, God. And as, as I cut off that train 30 minutes later, I was like, whoa. I was, I was, I was unbelieved that I was unscathed that I walked out of that. Uh, but yet, that didn't change my life. I still lived the same lifestyle. And time after time, God's hand was upon me. He was as upon me because, you see, he wanted to awake me to righteousness. He wanted to awake me to righteousness. So all these trials that I went through, were of my own doing, mind you, God still worked out for my good. As um, I was getting older and um, I was living um, a very sinful life, uh, uh, it was before I met my wife, I came to a point where I picked girls over my job. And I ended up losing my job. And therefore, it came down to the part that I was gonna be homeless the next day. And it took me to that point, to that realization as I looked around, I had no furniture left and there were so many situations that went on. My aunt died, I was living with my aunt, she had cancer and I was trying to help her out. But she had passed away, and then all this came into effect, and it brought me to my knees. It brought me to my knees, and I said, Lord, and I remember this prayer distinctly. I said, Lord, if this is what you have for me to be homeless, so be it. But if you have something more for me, so be it as well. Think about that, folks. Because here I was, a wayward man. God brought me to the to the point where he wanted to awake me to righteousness. So he used my own trials, my own tribulations, my own doings, and to bring me to a sense of awakeness. I want you to look at it, think about an example. How about the woman caught in adultery, right? Here she is, she's caught in adultery, and you could say she was probably loaded with a lot of guilt and shame. Here she was grabbed out, caught in the act of adultery, accosted, and brought in front of Jesus. You could say her life was at a crossroad. Although Jesus did not dismiss her sin or say, ah, that doesn't, that don't matter, it's okay. He did show her mercy. But he also gave her a little bit of judgment as well. He told her that her sin was forgiven, but she had to go and sin no more. Now, we're not told how she made out in her life, but her life was given back to her. She was too awake to righteousness, and her life was in her own hands. 
What about the woman at the well? Here she was living in unrepentant sin, living with a boyfriend. Jesus comes before her, right? And as she puts it, he says, she said, he told me everything I ever did. He told me everything I ever did. So, think about the guilt and shame that was upon her and the crossroads that she had now come to bear. She could have rivers of living water, but she had to make a choice. She was offered eternal life. Her life was at a crossroads. Would she let her life overwhelm her, or would she drink from the well? Well, we're not left to know what she did, but we're hoping that she did make the right choice. So we think about it. We think about how Jesus will let us come to our wit's end so that he's hoping that we're going to cry out for help. Think about that. What about the, the Israelites? How far did he let them go into bondage before they cried out? They cried out for help. And that led to them being pardoned and let out of Egypt, let out of sin. You know, for me, my pathway was dark. It was hopeless. And then that prayer, that prayer came. But I didn't think much more about it after that. A few months had passed by. Um, you see, um, what the funny part about it was, I was going to be homeless, and then the next day, I go to the mailbox, and there was a check from my cousin. Now, if you knew my cousin, he was more reckless than I, and he was destroy stuff. I would never be getting a check from him, but, but yet, there was this check. Now, it wasn't enough to get me into a new place or anything, but it was enough to at least feed me or, uh, or to give me some kind of relief. And just then, as I'm getting what little belongings I had, Together, there's a knock on the door. I open the door. There's my dad and my brother. Now, I hadn't said nothing to them. In those days, we didn't have cell phones, right? Uh, I didn't contact them whatsoever. But for some strange reason, there they were. Another answer to my prayer. And so my brother said, hey, I'm not going to let you be homeless. I'll let, I'll let you live. You know, you can get a job. You can get on your feet. You know, uh, you can come stay with me. Another answer to that prayer. But yet, I did nothing. Um, I still was uh, into um, wine, women, and song. And uh, that was my whole goal uh, every weekend. Um, I didn't realize I needed a savior. And then one day, we were in the bar. It was about midnight, and I had just had gotten a job. And we were about, I said, we got to head out. I'm, I'm, I got work in the morning. We we're heading out. and My brother goes, let's go talk to those three girls over there. Said, nah, man, I just want to go home. Right? I just want to go home. We, you know, Come on. Sure enough, that's why I meet my wife that night, that day. So now there's both of us. Both of us less than godly. Right? And... You know what? God was still there. God was still working in my life, though I didn't see it, though I, though I had made that prayer. Then all of a sudden, as I go to work one night, I was working midnight shift at this restaurant called Sambo's. It was a, like a uh, Denny's or something like that. And uh, I happened to have no waitress that day and no cook. All I had was a busboy and me, about three in the morning. This guy comes walking in, and I expect him to stop at the register. He's gonna, you know, get, wait to get seated. With him. He walks right to the booth that I'm sitting in. And the, the question that comes out of his mouth is, do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? And I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm kind of cool. I don't, I don't really want to confess that I'm, you know, I don't want to be a Jesus freak, you know. Um, um. And then my heart started weighing, and I couldn't, I couldn't deny Christ. I had to say, Yes, I, I believe in Jesus. And he started to explain stuff to me. And I don't remember 
how the conversation was going, but I was intrigued and I wanted to hear more, but another customer had came in the door and I went up to the register to take his order and I walked behind to cook it and I looked over at the booth thinking I want to hurry up and get back to the guy and he was gone. And I looked out and there was no lights in the parking lot, it was dark, there was windows everywhere. I didn't hear the bell ring on the door and I was thinking to myself, was I just tested, would I deny Christ or not? Did I just obtain, maybe, talk to an, entertain an angel unaware? It was very intriguing to me. Because especially as I look back on it, I really think I did that day. And I'm not one that's mystic or anything like that. But there was, there was no way that man could have made it out that door in that kind of time. I don't think he could have even made it to the bathroom in that time. So, here I am dabbling in Christ, right? I'm dabbling. What do I mean by that? Oh, yeah, uh, I'm not going to church, but uh, I'll read this booklet. I'll, I'll watch this half-hour show on, on TV or whatever the case may be, right? But no foothold. And I started thinking, you know, because Judy was barren, but she, she miscarried five times. We didn't have any children, you know, and so she was barren, and we were really wanting a child, and we prayed about it. And God heard our prayer once again from the darkness of our room, from the darkness of our heart. The light was beginning to shine in the darkness. Well, Needless to say, you, I stand in front of you today knowing that I had made a covenant with God through baptism, through the laying on the hands. You know, I was in agreement with God, but I was hardly perfect. In fact, some of the imperfections that I had, I wore, and my wife can be a testament to this, I wore them like a badge of honor like a little check mark on how many girls I dated or, or, or um, things like that. I wore them as a badge of honor. I didn't let go of those pet sins, right? I didn't let go of those. I liked those pet sins. I didn't want the changes to come in heavy. But there was two scriptures that started to really overwhelm me as well. And the first one was in 1 Peter 1, 16, it says, Be holy because I am holy. Be holy, because I am holy. Well, this was pondered upon me, and then as I'm looking, I see Matthew 5, right? And you get the Sermon on the Mount, and then we come to the conclusion in verse 48 of Matthew 5, be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. You know, you see, I knew I was a sinner. I knew Christ had done it all for me. I knew I couldn't save myself. That was not the issue. I knew that Christ was the perfect Savior. But for me to bless those who persecute me, to love my enemy, to put away all the things I was doing wrong, that seemed impossible. I mean, I had these pet sins. I had the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. All these things that I did not want to let go of, even though I accepted Christ as my Savior. So what did I ponder? As I read scriptures, I, I came to myself, and I, and, I, and I seen to myself, I said, I found nothing good in me. Perfection was impossible. I thought about the scripture, there's not one person that does good, not one. And I thought, well, how can I obtain Perfection. And you know what? I became overwhelmed by it. And then I thought about David, right? I thought about how he responded to people and their deeds and the things that they did against him. And he made this statement. He said his feet had almost slipped. He almost was led into sin. And I thought to myself, why did David feel this way? And how did he stop his feet from going out from underneath him? Well, you know what our scripture says? He went into the sanctuary. And he was instructed by God with godly wisdom. 
God's wisdom, his instructions and righteousness was something that David knew he had to lean on, he had to learn, and he had to trust in to solve all of his trials, to direct all of his thoughts, to direct all of his actions. He had to believe. He had to be empowered knowing that God was his shield, that he was his butler, and he was his very, very breath. Trusting in the Lord is what David did. And it's exactly what Jesus did as well. Jesus, God's plan, you know, with Jesus was, Jesus had to accomplish the overwhelming task of be thou perfect. And the result was perfection. Let's turn to Hebrews as I quote you uh, uh, a quote from Luke. Uh, because Jesus, and we're going to go to Luke, Hebrews 2.10. Uh, Jesus is our perfect Savior. He alone can bridge the distance that separates us, fallen mankind, and mold us into perfection, to perfection of God himself. Jesus took on the flesh and became like us. He had to work out his salvation, not only for himself, but for all mankind. Think about that. Luke 2.52 says, and you don't have to turn there, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. But wait, this is the Savior. He increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. We read in Hebrews 2.10, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. How did he do this? Well, we see he had grown in knowledge of what it was like to be in the flesh and all that that detailed. Look, flip over to Hebrews 5 and verse 8. And here we read Hebrews 5 and in verse 8. Although he was a son, although Jesus was the son of God, he learned obedience. Catch that phrase. He learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all that who obey him, in the same manner that he obeyed God. Be thou perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. He learned obedience. That means that Jesus moved from untested obedience into suffering trials, and then through the suffering of trials, he came into a proven, tested, and a proven obedience. He will follow me in all my ways. He will do. Have you seen my prophet Job? He's a perfect man in all, these, in all of his generations. Was he a perfect man? He was perfect to God. You know, Jesus did everything for us. And uh, you can uh, write these scriptures down. I'm not going to go to them. He's our perfect Savior. And we have to remember that we are to be perfect just like he is. And how does he become perfect? You know what he does for us? When we're tempted, he prays for us. You can find that in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. When we sin, he intercedes for us. You can find that in 1 John 2, 1 and 2. When we ask him, he presents our request to the Father. He, when we beseech him, he presents our prayers to the Father. You know, you can find that in John 16 and verse 23. You know what he does? He makes us perfect. Turn to Psalms 18, verse 32. Psalms 18, verse 32. It is God that girdeth me with strength and makes my way perfect. Now flip over to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5 and in verse 21. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may 
be made the righteousness of God in him. So how do we respond to that? Let's, let's see. Let's flip over to Hebrews again, back to Hebrews 4 and verse 14. Hebrews 4 and verse 14. Seeing then, look at what all Christ has done for us. Look at what he's the example he has set for us. That we have such a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with feelings of our infirmities, but was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So here's my analogy, guys. Right? Who's, who's enjoyed the game of bowling here? Has anybody enjoyed the game of bowling? Uh, bowling's fun, right? When you first step into a bowling alley, you, you get excited. You're ready to try your hand at the game. I can remember my first time ever walking into that bowling alley, right? But as I wanted to, the competition set in. The game became very challenging. Because I wanted to do good. I didn't want to lose. So bowling is a lot like life. You know, before Christ, I threw a lot of gutter balls. I mitched a bunch of spears. And I really had a strike. I really had a perfect frame even in my life. You know, when we're presented with scriptures like, be thou perfect, we can easily be defeated. Kind of like when you're trying to get a 300 in the first frame, you throw and the ball bounces off your leg and it goes in the gutter. Easily defeated. You know you're not going to hit your goal anymore. And so now the game, maybe you just start throwing the ball between your legs or, you know, uh, you know have their second drink or, or whatever the case may be. You just give up. See, being perfect like Jesus is just that same way. It's just overwhelming. Because they would be like bowling a 300, a perfect game, not once, but every time. You know, we have to think about it. When he said, have you seen my servant Job? And when he said that Abraham was a just man, we, when he talks about the saints... And how he seen them is perfect. There was no one like Job. He was perfect in all of his generations. Puts a new, puts a new twist on it, doesn't it? For me, I fumbled around the bowling alley, right? It was just like I was when I was first Christian. I was just dabbled in the word. I didn't really let it affect my life. I didn't, uh, didn't do what was required of me, uh, let alone go the extra mile. You know, for bowling, when bowling, it all changed when I joined a league. I wanted to win. I wanted to bowl that 300 game. So you know what I did? I bought my own ball, shoes, bag, rosin. I practiced. I'd go on, watch videos on how to hold the ball exactly. And I went from a straight ball to a throw a hook. And I just examined my game in every sense. Then there was other things. I had to try not to be distracted. I had to try not to fall into the old habits that had me throwing the ball pearly. This was the same with my walk with Christ after I was baptized. You know, I came out with all kinds of zeal. I wanted to be in his kingdom. I was on fire, right? I studied. I got maps out, and I got my Strong's Concordance, and I got my dictionaries. I even got my Bullinger's Companion Bible that I spent 50-something bucks back, well, way back then, right? All that practicing, all that instruction, all the videos I watched, this was the same thing as all the things I do with Christ. It could never land me a perfect game or perfect conduct. It was going to take more than that. Turn with me to Philippians 3 and in verse 11. Now Paul's saying in order here, he's saying in order to be conformed, to be like him, he's talking to his audience, he said, he had to see the goal and reach it. Uh, reading verse 11, it says, By any means, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul knows that this is when he will obtain perfection by putting on the incorruptible body. 
He explains, not that I've already attained it or am already perfect, but I press on that I may hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. Did you get that? He explains, not as I have already attained or am already perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to be apprehended. For one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Therefore, let us, as many who are mature, have this mindset. If any of you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already obtained, let us walk by the same rule and let us be of the same mind. So Jesus tells us, be thou perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. It's an expectation. It's also a warning. It's threefold. And it's a surety for everyone who believes. Now think about that. It's an expectation. But it's also a warning. And it's a promise for all those who believe. Because you will, this corrupted body will put on in corruption. The promise. The beautiful gift. Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and the spirit, perfecting holiness out of the reverence of God. Perfecting holiness out of the reverence of God. What do we do to do that? We purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body, contaminates the body and the spirit. What's he talking about? Look back at chapter 6. He starts out, Paul starts out in chapter 6 saying, this is the day of salvation. He's trying to prompt his audience into not only listening to the instructions in righteousness, but he wants them to put the hand to the plow in the same manner that he had. He wants them to come out of the dark and walk in Christ's marvelous light. So he tells them, open wide your hearts and make a covenant with Christ. Why does he tell them to be separate? Because he knows, and he stated in 1 Corinthians 15, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. In 1 John 2, flip over to 1 John 2, we read this, verse 5. I believe this is verse 5. I have 5 to 11, but I don't have it all written down here. So, uh, But though whoever keeps his word... In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. How do we know? The love of God. Now remember I talked to you about how I had a hard time. I was overwhelmed because my reaction was to pay evil for evil. I want to take you to the Psalms now. Because this is the perfect case. Of being like the Father. Be perfect as thou Father in heaven is perfect. Turn to Psalms 35 and verse 10. Here we pick up. You ready? Psalms 35 and verse 10. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from who, him who is too strong for him? Yes, the poor and the needy from him who plunders him. Fierce witnesses rise up. They ask me things that I do not know. They reward me evil for good. Too much. Too much. Let's look at that. So too much, the sorrow of my soul. He's being overwhelmed. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart. David's explaining how God perfected him to the point where he had even his emotions in check. He understood what we read in the New Testament. 
and pray that evil men would no longer be in his presence. Turn up now, flip over ahead to Psalms 139 and verse 14. 139 and verse 14, where we read David go on. Psalms 139 and verse 14. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. How precious are your thoughts toward me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more than the number of the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God! Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hated them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me into the way of life ever maintenance. Here we got a man after God's own heart. His hate turned into love. What did we just read? We just read that when they were evil to them, he fasted and prayed for them. He repaid good for evil. You know, that's exactly what it says in, when we remember we were in Matthew uh, and we ended up in verse 48 where it says, be thou perfect. But in verse 43, he says, love your neighbor and You've heard it, had it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sings rain on the just and on the unjust. You know, so here we're given this such great of a promise and he wants, God, Jesus wants to know how dedicated you are. Where is your heart? Is your soul his? Will you do all that he requests? You know, even Jesus said, Father, if you could take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. Turn into Luke 17, verse 10. We, we, read, we read our commission. It says, Luke 17, verse 10. So you too, when you have done everything you were commanded to do, should say, we are slaves undeserving of special praise. For we have only done what is our duty. You see, though we strive for the mastery, it is Christ that is our perfection for us. Every thought, every good thought, Every idea comes from him. Flip over now to 2 Peter 1 and verse 1. You see, for me, we came across this. I came across this. I was in this league, and we came across. We made it to the championship. And now we're going to bowl this team, and they come out, there's five guys on each team, and they're dressed all in black. And they're called the Skulls. And what they did from their very presence, if you've been a bowler, they just come up and try to intimidate you to get you off your game. Well, I was up to the test. They didn't, they didn't scare me any. And in fact, that just prompted me to want to do better. So I started out, first frame, strike one. Second frame, strike two. Third frame, strike three. Fourth frame, strike four. Fifth frame, strike five. And all the way, ninth frame, strike nine. All the while, the guys behind me patting this ball, making sounds, trying to get me to lose my concentration because all that instruction, everything had to be thought of. Everything had to be second nature. And that's the same way it is with Christ. You see, when we have put on Christ Jesus, all this would be second nature. So I get to the 10th frame. Strike one. Strike two. Now I'm, I'm putting my own pressure on myself. 
right? I've got 11 strikes in a row. I just need one more. And I'm thinking, I had just seen the guy blow on the pro bowling tour the week before through a gutter on the 12th frame of a perfect game. And I'm thinking, I bowl right off the edge. I mean, I, my ball comes like this and it goes boom right into the middle, right? And I'm thinking, just don't throw this in the drink, right? <laughs> I'm happy with 290 anything. So you see that? I was satisfied with my circumstance with 290 something. I didn't strive for perfection like I ought to be as I threw the ball. It came up light on the pocket and hit it. And the, but with the side motion, they started going back and forth. And there was one pin standing, but another pin was coming around to hit it. And at just that moment, another pin stuck out like this and blocked it. And I had a 299. Didn't quite hit perfection. Here we read in, in 2 Peter, verse 1, Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God, our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ according to his divine power. He has given all to us things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, putting on incorruption, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust, and to knowledge, add temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness. And beside this, give all diligence to add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity. If you do all these things, and they abound in you, you shall nearly never be barren or unfruitful in Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things are blind, and they can't see far off, and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, though, rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and the election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fail. You know, I had to look at bowling and compare that goal of the perfect game to my walk with Christ. I had to apply godly wisdom. I had to silence the quiet whispers of you're never going to make it. I had to use instruction, grace, and faith in order not to give up when trials came my way. And so I had to do these things when the whisper was whispering. Now, come into the dark. It's nice and comfortable in the dark. You don't have to do any work in the dark. Come on, you can just give up all you have and just, come on, let's, let's take a ride into the country. He wanted to give me, to give up my duty. But God told me, if a man puts his hand to the plow and turns away, he's unfit to be in the kingdom. You see how God's instructions always lead us to that perfect ending if we listen to them, if we learn them, if they become second nature. So for all of us here, I would say, know this, that he is the author and finisher of our faith. Trust in all of his ways. Take the time to meditate, to pray, to learn of his ways and to apply them to your life. Don't be overwhelmed because you're going to have trials. He said, in this world, you will have trials. But instead, concentrate on his word and the art of perfection. Thank you.